In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know whether you think our um, Luke reading sounds uh, normal for you um, in your community, your household, or um, whether you think it's um, slightly overblown. This would have been written amongst the latter books to have been written in the Second Covenant, the Greek Scriptures, the Christian Scriptures, And so persecution would have been beginning. And I imagine it would be a little bit like people living in Ukraine today. And certainly um, we tend to get taught more about World War II, don't we, here, perhaps, than is good for us. But we perhaps think of uh, occupied Europe and how people would have um, let the authorities know um, if there were people harbouring people um, in their house, in their town. And uh, families would have agreed and disagreed about how they should stand against the oppressor, what they should or shouldn't do, should they stay, should they leave. And this is written by and for Christians experiencing persecution. And there would have been those temptations to go back to the old way, to go forward with the new, to stand against Rome, to stand against the temple, to go with it. There would probably have been disagreements too about how to apply some of these new truths, laws, understandings. And Jesus says, you see a cloud rising in the west and you know it's going to rain, please God, that it does for us. Jesus is quite forthright that the people whom he is speaking to, reportedly in Luke, don't really understand what is going on in the world. It's interesting to have read this week a summary from our bishop about his experience of the Lambeth Conference. It's been reported in the media, even sadly in the Church Times, sort of picking up on the Legacy Press um, way of promoting the church has been outdated and uh, behind the times. So all I have seen in the, the media is that the bishops were all talking about gender expression, preference, identity and the like, and how we can um, disagree to disagree. But actually, the bishop's report is that the most pressing, universally pressing concern for all the people gathered together there was, in fact, climate change. And that there was a good deal of togetherness and unity um, about opposing injustice, about standing for what is right and true and good, standing for peace. And in fact, at one point, apparently in the proceedings, the archbishop said, it's okay to believe different things about these LGDP, LG." BT things. And when he said that, apparently there was this sort of free on tension, a bit like this sort of bishop against bishop, son against father, etc., etc. That sort of tension dissipated when the archbishop said it's okay to agree to disagree. And arguably, that is one of those things that the wider world is trying to teach us as the church how we should behave and how we should view these things. We're picking up on um, climate breakdown, would we learn other things from those amongst whom we live? Would they learn from us also? That's quite a hard and negative, chewy reading. We talked about families deciding whether they should go back to their old way or whether they should move on. Should we go back to how church was? Should we change things a little bit? I've been involved in the last week with one of our parishes where some new people, there are new kids on the block, and um, the people whose church it is in their minds are understandably nervous, coy, antagonistic even, towards this fresh blood, fresh impetus, new ways of thinking. And one has to hold them, arguably, in our prayers. But to my mind, unless the church is embraced by its community, then those of us who spend an hour a month in worship may not have it available to us to do that in, in the months and years ahead. Hebrews is written to Jewish background believers who are tempted to go back to their old ways, to cling on to the old tradition rather than going on in faith. And uh, the writer compares Jesus to all sorts of people in the Jewish um, Hall of Fame. And as we get to Hebrews 11, it's almost as if he sort of noticed that it's way past his bedtime 
and he's decided, therefore, to just wrap up relatively quickly. So he says, what more should I say? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, etc. Um, you might like to decide to have um, an Easter series on uh, some of those people or just to go home and uh, look them up online or in your um, Bible dictionary. Um, Rahab is um, not necessarily what we would consider to be a prostitute. The words that we use today are relatively recent um, definitions, but she was clearly an excluded person in her community, and her community was uh, living in a part of the world that the Jewish people were of the view God had told them was theirs. They had sent some spies. She realised, looking at the west, seeing the cloud coming, that God's people were in the ascendant, So she hid the spies, looked after them, did a deal with them, so that when the Jewish people took over her people and ethnically cleansed um, her part of, I don't know whether it's Palestine that she was living in, but there are echoes even um, with justice issues today in that regard. But she was saved because she looked after the spies that were sent by God's people. And uh, she hung a red cord out of her window. And I, it intrigues me to think that red cord might have been a bit like the red light. You know, it might have been her sign, of her trade, her profession, if we may call it that, or her abuse, or the way she was being used by the people of her town. But that same identity that caused her downfall and hurt and pain was also arguably her restoration and her salvation. Red, of course, we think of blood and uh, the sacrifices in the Hebrew tradition and our own understanding of God dying as Jesus to set us free. And as we wear that emblem, then we are saved and those around us in our household, in our community, are too. The writer to Hebrews says, well, this person was sawn in half. That person decided to be put to death rather than uh, reject their faith, and therefore they received a better resurrection. We may not perhaps experience some of that, but we may feel hard-pressed, this few Number, small number of us here in church this morning. Where is everybody else? Does our community really understand? Have our gifts and talents really been upheld and promoted as we think they should have been within our own community, within our church? The writer to Hebrews concludes this passage that we have before us this morning by saying... Since we are surrounded by all this stuff, this encouragement, this cloud of witnesses... Let us put aside all these burdens, these worries, these anxieties. Let us run with perseverance. We've heard about cycling, and I just have to take my hat off to defer to your experience, really. But I would imagine that uh, there are times we don't really feel like going out on the bike. But we know that if we are going to achieve what we've set our sights on, we are jolly well going to have to. And so it is with church. There are some things that we don't want to do, like having children in the building, for heaven's sake. But unless we do that... We will never have adults in the building when they grow up. We might not want to have the um, churchyard looked after for weeds and wildlife because we might want to visit uh, ancestors and uh, people we know in the churchyard. We might think it's disrespectful to them. These sort of burdens, these worries, what we have to push through to get to where we're looking at. Some things we have to endure for the crown that is set before us. We are to look to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He disregarded the shame of the cross, the present circumstance for what he saw ahead of him. He has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. And I was just reading this morning in morning prayer. We got the days wrong last week, so we did the 8th of Trinity reading for BCP. And in it, um, it talked about us as being co-heirs with Christ. So if this is... Jesus, end point, sitting, having done all that he needs to do with the deity, that otherness that we engage with through Jesus, then that would also be our end point. All this, arguably, is as nothing to that great glory, awe and wonder when we arrive at that finishing line. Amen.